Okay, thank you for joining our webinar on effective diabetes prevention and management during emergency situations. This is the final webinar of our four-part COVID-19 webinar series, Resource Sharing and Discussions with the Frontline. My name is Gladys Carrillo and I'm excited to get us started today. Here's a quick list of our learning objectives. Our main goal with these webinars is to provide you with tips and resources on what you can do to better serve your communities during this pandemic, especially vulnerable populations like those with chronic illnesses like diabetes. We also want to provide a platform to share ideas and strategies with each other. So thank you for joining us today and for being willing to provide feedback in helping us better understand how the COVID crisis is impacting health centers and farm workers across the country. We welcome your input throughout our presentation and encourage you to type in the chat box assistance you may need to continue your diabetes prevention and self-management efforts. For those that, of you that may not be familiar with us, we are the National Center for Farm Worker Health. We're located in Central Texas and our mission is to improve the health of farm workers and their families by providing training, technical assistance, and support to health centers that serve this population across the country. One way we are able to accomplish our mission is through collaborations and partnerships with health centers and organizations like the ones being represented by our speakers today who directly serve the ag worker population. So I just wanna acknowledge ADSES, CMAR Community Health Center, and Columbia Basin Health Association for joining us and being a part of today's webinar. So as I mentioned, collaboration is key. One organization we have partnered with since 2014 is the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists, formerly known as AADE. And CFH has collaborated with ABSIS on a number of different projects. In our current grant cycle, we de developed a learning collaborative supported by HRSA to further the knowledge of health centers in developing and implementing certified diabetes self-management training and diabetes prevention programming. Through our partnership with ADSIS, we disseminated information about the National Diabetes Prevention Program, recruited a number of organizations to apply as a 1705 affiliate site, hosted a Spanish lifestyle coach training, developed educational materials, and launched the Diabetes Resource Hub you see on your screen. The Diabetes Resource Hub houses information and tools to further the initiative of preventing, managing, and treating prediabetes and diabetes. Now with the current pandemic, it is that much more critical for health center staff to take the appropriate steps when serving patients and educating them about proper CDC recommendations. The coronavirus, like any other virus, can cause serious complications for people with underlying health conditions, including individuals with diabetes. Having said that, our group of presenters today are here to offer their expertise on diabetes prevention and management, especially during emergency situations like the current pandemic. We will provide resources to help you continue supporting patients affected by this chronic illness. Please welcome our first presenter, Natalie Allison from ADSES. Thanks, Gladys. Um, and thank you everyone on the call for allowing me to present on today's webinar. I hope you can all hear me clearly. Um, again, my name is Natalie Ellison and I am the Manager of Prevention at the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists. Um, next slide. So I really wanted to kick off by giving just a, a quick overview of our organization, what the national DPP is, and how organizations across the country are working to continue to provide a lifestyle change program to their community members during this pandemic. Um, so ADCES, uh, a little bit about us, we are a membership-based association with uh, over 14,000 members, including healthcare professionals such as nurses, dietitians, pharmacists, um, exercise specialists, among many other 
individuals and, and healthcare professionals. Our goal is to really ensure optimal health and quality of life for those with or at risk for diabetes and other chronic conditions. We are working closely with organizations all across the country to provide both diabetes self-management education as well as preventative services, including offering uh, the Diabetes Prevention Program, which will be the primary focus of today's conversation. In 2017, our organization actually received a five-year cooperative agreement to activate the National Diabetes Prevention Program within underserved communities with little or no access to CDC-recognized lifestyle change programs. So we're working in cities and rural communities, and we're working to engage priority populations such as Hispanic and Latinos, African Americans, Medicare beneficiaries, men, and others that really tend to underutilize the National Diabetes Prevention Program. So we're currently working with 22 different organizations in 11 states across the country. Hopefully you can see um, our reach through the map on your screen. These organizations include everyone from community-based organizations, migrant health centers, FQHCs, health departments, um, health systems, among many others uh, that have been providing the lifestyle change program to their local community members. Next slide, please. For those of you who maybe aren't as familiar with the program, I did want to just give a brief overview. Um, so the National Diabetes Prevention Program, or also known as the National DPP, was created really to address um, the increasing burden of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes that we're facing in the U.S. This is a national effort to create partnerships between public and private organizations to offer an evidence-based intervention that helps prevent and delay type 2 diabetes. One of the, the really key features of the National DPP is the CDC Recognized Lifestyle Change Program. So this is a year long or, or really a 12 month program focused on healthy eating and physical activity. And it's been shown for those with prediabetes, if they partake in this program, they can actually reduce their risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 58%. Um, and for those that are 60 or older, it reduces it by 71%. Next slide, please. So with the majority of existing DPP programs providing the lifestyle change program, most of them are delivering it in person. And the effects of COVID-19 have significantly impacted organizations' ability to offer this year-long intervention, as well as it's impacted participants being able to engage or, you know, partake in this type of intensive program. I actually think that there's about 80 to 90 percent of, of existing programs are delivering the lifestyle change program in person. Um, so that's pretty significant. For those that are on the line that are currently CDC-recognized DPP providers, on March 18th, CDC did issue guidance regarding switching to distance learning or online delivery. And they also provided information on pausing or postponing programs. Um, so just a quick overview of what that guidance looked like. So they're encouraging organizations to use virtual makeup sessions whenever possible. Um, an organization may offer as many virtual makeup sessions as necessarily as necessary, uh, regardless of their usual or traditional delivery mode. If virtual makeup sessions are not feasible, you can also pause offering classes altogether. Organizations are being held harmless during any pauses, meaning CDC will allow you to continue to maintain your recognition status regardless of whether um, you're able to make a data submission or really if you pause your program. When organizations decide to resume classes, they should really consider whether it makes sense to pick up where they left off or restart the program for week one. 
Uh, this really depends on the length of the lapse. So one thing to consider is if you've been offering this program and you started a new class that's only been going for one to two weeks, you might wanna just restart that. Whereas if you have a class that's been running for eight to nine months now, you're probably going to just pick up where you left off. Next slide, please. So it's important to stay connected to your Lifestyle Change Program participants, obviously now more than ever. Whether your organization has made the decision to pause your program or has made that transition to distance learning or virtual delivery, uh, staying connected with, connected with program participants helps you to not only support their progress in achieving the Lifestyle Change goals, it aids with the program retention when you do re-engage with them, and it also really honors the challenges that we're all facing related to eating activity and social isolation. And I think we can all kind of relate to that. Next slide, please. So I have compiled here just a list of ideas or activities that we have heard organizations across the country that they're doing and trying to uh, implement to keep participants engaged. Some of these have come from other training entities that work closely with a lot of other CDC recognized organizations. Um, so some of the things that uh, you should consider utilizing are you know, tools to reach out to your participants, such as um, you know, group emails, uh, individual group phone calls, um, Facebook groups, things like that. You can also, if you made the decision to pause your program, you can set up a group chat asking everyone to just kind of share their personal experiences and, and how they're dealing with COVID-19. Um, if you're feeling really ambitious, we've seen sites that are doing at-home cooking demos. Um, I've actually seen, you know, a, a colleague of mine uh, and a friend, a personal friend who's actually doing cooking demos and using her own children to kind of assist in the kitchen. So that's kind of a fun, creative way we've seen things um, be presented. And other things are really, you know, just staying connected with your participants on a regular basis, whether that's weekly or biweekly. You can do something as simple as, you know, sending an email, sharing some healthy recipes or um, exercises that they can do in their home. You know, seeing how they're doing with um, keeping on track with their action plans and eating goals and things like that. Um, so these are just a few suggestions. We'll hear a lot more from uh, some of our later presenters on what they're doing at their specific organizations. So next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so the last thing I want to mention before handing it off uh, to our other speakers is that utilizing virtual health programs or platforms to connect with your patients can really help expand the reach of your program. It can help remove some of those traditional barriers for both diabetes education and support as well as diabetes prevention. Um, telehealth might not be an option for everyone, but something to at least consider. Um, if you are considering offering a program via telehealth, it's important to understand some of the requirements or challenges that you should think through. So some of those things might be what type of technology will you use to deliver your program? How will you onboard individuals? How will you facilitate a group discussion uh, virtually? That can be a challenge for some new lifestyle coaches. Um, our organization, ADCS, uh, has compiled a variety of resources to help you evaluate your needs when considering launching telehealth services or determining if you have the capacity to offer a program um, via telehealth or distance learning. So for those of you providing diabetes self-management education, there is a lot of information on the website listed on your screen. And we are working um, really hard to include more information specifically around diabetes prevention. Um, we're also in the process of building out a toolkit to help sites um, kind of guide them through the distance learning process. So again, I encourage you to take a look at that website if you have a chance. 
I am going to now turn it over to two of our organizations that we support under the cooperative agreement that I mentioned earlier. Um, the first presenter is going to be from Columbia Basin Health Association. Um, there's a couple of different presenters from their organization. Um, but Karina Garcia will start us off and share what their organization is doing to support their community during COVID-19. Thank you, Natalie. This is Karina Silva Garcia. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, um, I am the Diabetes Prevention Program Coordinator at Columbia Basin Health Association. And today I will be presenting along with my colleague Leo Gaeta, Director of Programs, Isis Carrillo, Health Educator. And uh, we are a community and migrant health center. We are located in southeastern Washington. And we currently have three clinics one in Othello, Washington, Canal, Washington and Marawa, Washington. And uh, we're excited to share some of the adaptations and some of the changes that we are doing with our diabetes prevention program classes. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we know that the COVID has impacted many people across the nation differently. And for us, pre-COVID, uh, all of our sessions were in person. And we currently had seven groups that were doing the, the sessions, the DBT sessions in person. However, we had to make some adaptations in our program. And our initial response to COVID-19 uh, during the first two weeks, and that was at the beginning of March, we were focusing on doing supportive calls. And in this supportive calls, we were explaining the participants, the changes that we were making. Uh, for example, we were let letting them know that we were pausing the classes for about two weeks. And this time, it served for us to to focus on um, the education for our patients on COVID-19, on the prevention uh, measures and the impact that it would have in our lifestyles. Uh, we also took this time to learn about the technology and the resources available to our families and to our participants. We wanted to know specifically if they had internet access, if they had phone service, and for us to know how, what would be the best way to re-engage our participants. Uh, so during the third and the fifth week, uh, that's when we decided to re-engage our participants for the session. And we found out that for some participants, one-on-one -on -one calls work better. Uh, for other conference calls uh, work best. And for some groups, uh, the video conference calls seem to, to work. Um, and we were using Doximi as the platform for those video conferences. We also understand that changing circumstances require different responses. So during the six weeks to now, we're still assessing the impact that COVID-19 has in our community. For example, are the participants gaining weight? Uh, what is their exercise time? Uh, what are the coping strategies that they're using? How are they managing this stress? And how can we be a support to them as well? And uh, we're also constantly seeking creative ways to keep our participants engaged in our sessions. Uh, next slide, please. So for example, uh, some of the strategies to maintain that our patients engage uh, during our virtual sessions, we are focusing on open-ended questions. And we know that this time can be very overwhelming uh, due to COVID-19. And we're constantly asking them, sharing their experiences, what is working well for them, what is not working well uh, for them. And we want them to be more engaging and also share those experiences with other participants in the sessions. Um, outside the class, we are focusing on, on having group text messages. And these group text messages, they share, um, if, it helps for us to share motivational messages. It also serves for us to do class reminders. Uh, we also share pictures of our meals. And not only the participants, but also the coaches do share the, 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 the pictures of meals. And uh, also some participants have shared some recipes. And we're constantly focusing on, on the positive and seeking creative ways to support each other. And uh, another thing that we are doing is we are delivering the incentives. Uh, for example, this week we have a graduating class and we are delivering their certificates of completion um, and also uh, a lot of um, incentives to their houses. Of course, uh, following the social distance rule and also making sure that they are at home so that they can receive their incentives. And um, and now my, my, my colleague Isis will be sharing with us a little bit more about how we are keeping our participants engaged at home. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you, Karina. So with our clinics, a lot of our clinics are in rural areas, uh, Madewell, Telo, and also Canel. 
Our participants are also uh, migrants and farm workers, so we wanted to make sure to help them um, with the needs that they were needing during this time of COVID. So based on our initial calls um, with our response in March, we saw that we needed to re-emphasize strategies to promote self-management at home. So participants during our calls were mentioning that due to COVID, they were um, feeling depression due to staying at home, anxiety of whether or not they could return back to work, and then also less motivated to continue working towards their goals. So because of this, we make sure to incorporate the importance of self-care and emotional health into the telehealth sessions that we were holding. Um, besides this, we also encourage participants to continue making progress towards their goals. So a lot of our participants uh, were already uh, going through the session, so they were already making progress, and we were letting them know that even though we are staying more at home, that doesn't mean that they don't have to be exercising or eating healthy. So the first component to this was keeping each other accountable. So uh, pre-COVID, we were doing this in person with our sessions, and we were also sending uh, group messages. Now, uh, during this COVID situation that we're going through, we are increasing our communication with our participants. So we are calling them more often and sending group messages to check in to see how their progress is going and to make sure that if they're having any challenges, that we're helping them cope with them. Um, another aspect of it um, for the DPP classes is getting their weight and their activity time. So now um, through these telehealth sessions, we're making sure that we're still continuing with that effort but making sure that we do it through private messaging so that we can get their weight and their activity time before each session um, is going on. Um, also for keeping each other accountable within the group itself, participants are sending pictures of healthy eating choices that they're making and also pictures of themselves so they can see the progress that they're going through um, in order to reach the goals that they have. Uh, the first goal for many of our participants is eating healthy. So for eating healthy, our participants stated that they were encountering some challenges. So for example, um, a lot of them mentioned stress eating, so overeating because they were staying more at home, they were bored, they were lonely, and then also um, some issues with uh, grocery shopping. So now that they were staying more at home, they were having issues with going to the grocery store as often as they were doing so before. Uh, to support patients with the effort of eating healthy, we reminded patients about the session information that we had already covered during previous sessions. So for example, um, for stress eating and overeating, we reminded patients of he healthy behaviors that they could be doing like uh, meditating and yoga to help them cope with that stress and that boredom that they were experiencing. Uh, for shopping, we were reminding patients to keep reading the food labels when they're going out to the store, but to also um, something helpful that we covered in other sessions was to make like a grocery list that way they're avoiding going to the store um, for many trips and just go when necessary. Um, another aspect to grocery shopping that we also make sure to cover is COVID prevention. So making sure participants were understanding that when they were going to the grocery store, they were taking the precautions of social distancing, disinfecting and washing hands often. Um, another goal our participants also have uh, with the program is uh, activity minutes or staying active. Our participants mentioned that right now, um, even though they are staying at home, they are continuing to stay active through gardening outside of their home or spending time with their families. But they also uh, presented the concern of not knowing other workouts that they can do at home and then also uncertainty of what they were allowed to do because of the restrictions in our community uh, due to COVID. So to support participants with staying active, we reminded them about different activities they could do at home. For example, um, watching exercise videos online. And then we also educated them on the um, staying at home order that we have in Washington State. So even though they are uh, staying at home and not leaving unless necessary, we are reminding them that they can go outside for a walk or for um, a jog, but just to make sure that they are keeping uh, social distancing and other prevention measures um, for COVID. Um, lastly, even though COVID has impacted the way that our participants are working towards their goals, here at CBHA, our coaches are continuing to encourage our participants to stay motivated and engaged so that can keep working towards their goals of eating healthier and physical activity, um, but also to uh, continue with these efforts because they've already, they have already made progress and that way they continue to finish that progress. Um, lastly, our participants are also clients here, their patients with our clinic. So our clinic is also providing support to them in different ways. 
And my colleague Leo is going to mention some of the ways um, in the next slide, please. Thank you, Isis. Uh, uh, much like everybody across the nation, uh, uh, the onset of COVID had huge impacts in our communities, bringing uh, uh, many of services to a halt. Uh, um, here at CBHA, from day one, we, we established a COVID-19 uh, task force, which uh, really looked at the, 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 the patient care aspect of the services we delivered. Um, one of the, the first pieces was that there was a lot of confusion with our patients saying, stay at home if you're sick, you know, don't come to the clinic and things like that. So many of our patients uh, face a lot of challenges because many of them have pre-existing appointments with a provider. They have chronic disease conditions like diabetes, uh, hypertension. Uh, we had some of these sessions uh, already scheduled out. So, so uh, initially we had to do a lot of education to our patients uh, and um, we, we clearly de uh, delineated the, the focus to be urgent uh, care visits were to be continued uh, through their providers uh, 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 once the provider authorized that. Uh, um, we also quickly transitioned to telehealth because we saw that the patients had a lot of questions and, and they didn't, still needed follow-up. So uh, that transition was relatively quick in organization. Within about uh, four to five days, we were able to deliver uh, telehealth. Um, one of the, the strong elements uh, at, the, at the initial phase was the protection of our employees and, and our staff and our patients. And so uh, uh, we implemented uh, uh, right away the, the screening at the entrance of our, our sites uh, for symptoms and, and uh, 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 directed those patients to a, a, a separate section to be screened for further uh, 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 factors uh, related to COVID. Um, the other aspect we took uh, 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 strongly was uh, the education of our communities. Um, we uh, uh, developed a couple of uh, videos internally that we shared through our website and through other mediums that focused on what is COVID and, 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 and the symptoms and, and, and preventive measures that people can take, as well as addressing the, the emotional health, uh, because a lot of our, our community responded with fear, um, uh, not knowing uh, the work environment. Some of the families uh, uh, saw a lot of panic, uh, the store shelves were empty and a lot of those things. So, so, so we started bringing that component of information through different videos as well as handouts. Uh, 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 we have a lot of visual handouts that we developed to support that. Um, we also partnered with our, our, our community partners. Our local health department quickly became overwhelmed. So our health education team uh, uh, stepped in to, to help provide education and support for patients that were being placed on isolation or quarantine status, or even answer questions for patients that just had general concerns regarding their health, uh, whether it would be diabetes or other elements. Uh, we found that we ended up uh, implementing a lot of supports like delivering medications, uh, 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 coordinating appointments with the doctors. Uh, 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 if they weren't urgent, move them down the line for another time so there was a, a, a appointment for follow-up. But we also used a lot of the local resources from our health department uh, to share with our community. Um, the uh, State Department of Health had a wealth of information as well as uh, national resources like the CDC uh, and others um, for us, as we keep transitioning this, uh, the COVID experience has been an evolving experience. Pretty much every day has a different flavor to it. And what we do is we take that information and we see how we can use it to manage patient care, but also to share with our communities. For our DPP program, as Karina mentioned earlier, we are graduating a cohort this week and next week we're graduating another cohort. And we're talking about re-engaging our patients. We've already made communication with our providers, letting them know that we're open for business, we wanna continue referrals. And, and the way we're looking at this is cohorting groups based on the resources they have, with, whether it be technology, conference calls, one-on-ones. Uh, -on -ones. So, so we're retooling to be able to meet those and, and we're evaluating the incentives we provide because we're looking at more of providing uh, technology support. Some of the families share with us that you know, they don't have enough minutes in their package or, or, or bandwidth to, uh, uh, to do video streaming and things like that. So, so we're retooling to, to be able to deliver services in a new way to continue providing lifestyle support uh, or lifestyle coaching and support for our families. And with that being said, I'll transition it to our colleagues at CMAR uh, for further conversation. Rocio? Thank you very much, everyone. I hope that you can hear me okay. 
My name is Rocio Castillo Fall. I'm the Health Education Program Manager at CIMAR Community Health Center. A little bit about CIMAR. CIMAR is a community based organization in, located in Western Washington. Uh, we have more than 90 medical, dental, and behavioral clinics. And we do offer nutrition, nu nutritional, social, and educational services. Um, we specialize in the Latino community and we do work with farm workers. Next slide, please. Um, the adaptations in the programming, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what CIMAR um, has been adopting during this COVID-19 pandemic and how it, the pandemic has been affecting our classes on uh, our DPP program. CIMAR Community Health Center main class delivery option was in person, but due to COVID-19, it was very clear to us that we needed to adapt quickly to other alternatives, such as offering classes virtually through platforms such as Zoom, and also use phone conference options to continue supporting our DPP patients. Uh, the adoption of such modalities uh, was adopted within a week to ensure that uh, we will not lose momentum and the patients could feel supported during this critical time. Nevertheless, we did lose some patients due to the changes in their job schedules and um, changes in the family dynamics due to COVID-19. Um, here in Washington State, uh, we still have the stay home, stay safe law. This was, was implemented early uh, in March and uh, it's supposed to go until May 4th. So you could understand that we needed to make certain changes to make sure that our patients could continue with these classes. Please, next slide. Yeah, um, as you might know, COVID-19 exposed the inequity that minority groups experience to obtain and engage in preventive health services because of structural barriers, limitations and job skills and reduced social support among, among others. Um, therefore, our recommendation here at CMR to provide DPP classes to the community are number one, uh, let's think about um, how to serve our communities. Let's think outside the box and practice having an open mind. Sometimes we forget to listen to the patient needs and we want to keep pushing classes. Sometimes uh, we believe that the best is canceling classes. Um, but to fully support our patients, I do believe, and we here at CIMAR believe that it's important to listen to our communities and their needs. Uh, number two, as well, and when the crisis like this happens, everyone gets extra busy, especially upper management and administrators who might lose focus of the diabetes prevention program, as well as all their social programs that we can be having at our local organizations. Therefore, I believe that it's important that we as coordinators of the DPP program, we should explain and remind the leadership of the organizations that we serve the purpose and the goals of the diabetes prevention program. And number three, I think it's very important to emphasize to everyone that the preventive health services can help people to stay healthy and help them to avoid getting sick. Otherwise, there is a high risk that the pre-diabetic patients that we serve could come back uh, to the clinics with a diagnosis of diabetes and much more complications. Um, another another um, a point I would like to discuss with everyone and I would like to mention here, from my um, role as manager, is that it's important that we um, remind ourselves that we must advocate uh, within organizations for relocation of, of funds to pay for media outlets that allows to reach people and support them during these critical times. I do agree um, with my um, colleagues here that many of our patients are now having access to internet, um, they are not having access to, to phones even. So it's very important for us that we continue advocating for these patients. Next slide, please. Um, well, I wanna, I wanna emphasize that COVID-19 um, reveal and emphasize social disparities, especially around technology access. Uh, many of our patients uh, have mentioned that they do have Facebook, but they do have limited internet services to join video conferences. Uh, some others, um, let's be honest, they're very, very intimidated by technology. So 
uh, for some of you who are uh, delivering DPP classes up there or that are thinking about starting DPP, I think it's important uh, to be flexible, to have a lot of patience and compassion for the people that you serve, but also the people that you lead um, during this pandemic. And our best, the best role that we can do is advocate uh, each day for patients to uh, reduce those barriers for um, technology access and to be able for them to get information that they need to have healthy lives. Next slide, please. For us at CIMAR uh, Community Health Center, so I'm going to have my, my colleague, my coworker, Sharon Scarbett, to go more into detail about how to uh, maintain and retain patients and keep them engaged. Um, but I think that here to, um, at CMR and through the experience um, serving the community and offering DPP, I think that one of the best ways to connect with our patient and keep them engaged is to pick up the phone. Just reminded that we're here, that there is help, that they belong to a group that cares about them, and that they are not isolated. Um, it's a lot of confusion. It's a lot of information about COVID-19, uh, so, sometimes too much information that could be even much more confusing for the community or might be um, just getting in, in a small parts. So it's important for us just to, to pick up the phone and, and remind them that we're here if they have questions. Uh, instead of creating more confusion, we're here to, to help them to find the right answer. Uh, and um, as I said, I'm going to introduce to all of you Sharon Scarpet. Uh, she's the health care at Puyallup Medical Center, and uh, she's been a champion uh, for the DPP program here at Zimmer. Um, she started the program since day one, and uh, yeah, she's going to be sharing with you the strategies that she has followed during this pandemic to engage uh, her DPP patients. Thank you. Next slide. Hi, thank you, Rocio, for introducing me. Um, yes, so it has been a difficult time uh, with everything that has been happening, but the way that we were able to uh, do this program with everything that's been going on is preparing for, for your classes. So we first, what we did was move over to phone conference calls, um, but we wanted to make it uh, just better so you can see each other and it's, it's better just to have the Zoom conference calls instead of the phone calls for our population. Um, so as a facilitator, it's important to become familiar with Zoom. It's encouraged to have a trial run with your coworkers as practice. Uh, I had a, a little difficulty at first with the audio, so it's important to just practice, make sure everything is working. Also, um, letting patients know ahead of time the number, the access code to the call if you're doing calls, also sending them uh, the Zoom invitation to their email. That way they can just click on the day of and they'll be able to access Zoom. Uh, it's important to remind them the day before or the day of that the class is still happening. So that way they don't forget. Also what I've been doing is I come to the clinic, I print out the classes, let's say like class nine, 10, 11, I hole punch those, I get those ready, and I send them through the mail to participants. That way, when we do have our Zoom phone calls, um, it's right there in front of them. And if that's not possible, maybe emailing that to them so they can pull up the session and they can see it um, in another screen. Another thing you can do is sharing your screen with them so they can also follow along. Next slide, please. Okay, so when you are delivering a class, it is very similar to the in-person class. Um, that's what we saw with the Zoom. You want to keep using motivational interviewing. You want to ask participants to read out loud. That way they'll still feel engaged and um, collaborate with the group. And with a lot of sessions, there's always a little bit of space where you can write down what your plan is to be healthy, be more active. So giving the patients a chance to write down, letting them know, okay, you have three minutes to write down your thoughts, and we're going to go and share with the group. So each person can share. That way, one person that's really quiet can also share. Uh, another thing we talked about was stress management techniques. You can do those before, during, or after class, whatever uh, fits best with your, your group. And at the end of class, we also like to open it up for comments, words of encouragement that the participants would like to share. Um, the first few sessions, a few people couldn't 
show up because their schedules had changed. So when we did finish the group session, they wanted to, the ones that were able to participate, wanted to share with everybody that they were happy we were still doing groups, that they wished the best for everybody, uh, and just those words of motivation to keep us going. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. And with this, with these changes, there are obstacles that do come along. So, for example, a few obstacles were that the participants will be on the Zoom conference call, but there will be like background noise. Their children will ask them questions. Um, maybe they're like cooking at the same time. So, just letting them know to be mindful that it is an hour long. They do have more time to focus on other activities. Um, also, if they could turn down the TV or if they could turn it off. Um, and another obstacle would be the schedules. They changed so people aren't able to attend. So what we did is we call them like the next day or the that during that same week and talk to them about what we discussed during the group, um, offer them resources, see what we can help them with. And the last obstacle was difficulty accessing Zoom. A lot of our patients, they're not very familiar with that platform, uh, but they have children that are very tech savvy, so they help them get on Zoom. Um, and if they don't have children, maybe something that you can do as a facilitator, maybe sending them an email with a YouTube video that shows how to use Zoom, or maybe having like a step-by-step -step instruction guide. Okay, uh, next slide. And so we also had resources for our participants. Uh, we talked about fitness videos. The YMCA has a lot of different ones. They have bar, yoga, tai chi. Uh, so I, I sent that to them. Uh, we also talked about mental health, coping with COVID, and what to do just for our well being. Uh, other resources were just to stay informed, letting them know that we are here to support them. And the last resource was a breathing technique that helps people go to sleep, uh, also just try to be like stress-free and focus on their breathing. And yes, um, I'll send it back to you, Gladys. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you to all of our other presenters with that um, useful information to our audience. So now we, you, you know, you've heard a couple examples from the health centers that have joined us today in terms of how this pandemic has affected their operations, but we're very curious to hear from our audience in terms of how this emergency crisis has affected your uh, service delivery. So we're gonna go ahead and pose a couple questions and if you can put your responses in the chat box so that we can have a little bit of a discussion and exchange about what's happening for you in on the ground in your service area. So our first question is just in general, what is your experience with this pandemic? How has your health center been impacted by the current crisis? So I'll give you guys a few minutes to respond and we'll see what kind of exchange we have in our chat box. Another thing you can share if you'd like is, how have you adapted your diabetes prevention and self-management programs? You know, you just heard CMAR and Columbia Basin talk about how they've changed their services to try to be flexible with the participants, to accommodate for their needs. So we're curious to hear from you now in terms of how you have maybe modified some of your service delivery to maintain patient engagement especially those individuals that are impacted by diabetes. Okay. I just saw someone indicate that they're doing video calls on WhatsApp, which is um, available 
but that the issue is still being unable to visit them directly in person. Seems like someone else has been providing technology, so computers, phones to health centers in order to facilitate telehealth, so thank you for that. I'm sure our health centers are very appreciative of being able to provide their patients additional ways to access the services that they need. Anyone else that would like to share their health center's experience or how they have changed operations to continue providing services to individuals impacted by diabetes? Someone else just mentioned that they've heard organizations are mailing out sessions and healthy recipes, doing follow-up calls to those that have access to internet, which is a great way. I think one of our presenters indicated also printing out material and mailing it. So if that's something available to you and something you could do to your patient for your patients to have that curriculum and information in front of them, I'm sure it'd be very helpful. Okay, well, we welcome you to continue to provide us feedback because we're always continuously looking for ways to support you, looking at resources and tools that we could develop for you to continue best serving your patients. As Leo mentioned, this pandemic is uh, evolving every day, so there's something new that we're continuing to learn um, with this COVID-19, but we are at, we at NCFH are always looking at ways to improve our services and to help you in continuing your patient uh, service delivery. So now I'm just gonna go over some of the resources that we currently already have available and that are established as of right now. As each of our presenters noted, they have designated web pages specific to COVID-19. So I would encourage you to explore these established resources. Um, ADCES has their own page specific to COVID and has support available as well as Columbia Basin and CMAR for their respective um, areas. So if you um, are familiar with your local community health center or are part of a, a health center and have information in particular that you can share with your community, that's a way that you can do that um, and provide information as well. We at NCFH have created a COVID page um, two that is accessible through our web, web, main website. Um, you will see a number of resources, including our new Mass for Farm Workers initiative. So NCFH recently partnered with the Justice for Migrant Women in support of this campaign. And this campaign is meant to raise awareness and appreciation of farm workers while mobilizing others in the fashion industry and in our communities to sew masks to protect agricultural workers. You can, sir, uh, you can support this effort by selling or contributing materials for the mass. You can also request um, a uh, mass through our Call for Health program or by contacting us directly at the number listed on the screen. Supplies are limited, so we would encourage you to please indicate the types of masks that you will need, whether they're masks for your actual health center staff or for farm workers that you plan to distribute in your service areas. So we encourage you to contact us here at NCFH if you have a need for this. I know personal protective equipment has been in high demand. And so we have um, some uh, opportunity to be able to help and support in this. So if you have a request, we encourage you to contact us 
or if you're willing to support this effort and can sew or provide masks for health center staff and farm workers, we also encourage you to contact us so that we can help distribute that PPE to areas that are in need of such supplies. And you can do that, like I mentioned, through our Call for Health program. This is a nationwide toll-free health and information referral service. The purpose of this program is to increase access to healthcare services for agricultural workers and their families. And we currently have two bilingual information staff that are um, attending to this hotline that help connect farm worker families to the closest migrant or community health centers, or at least to uh, any alternative source of um, healthcare if a health center is not available. So like a free clinic or a health department or a private doctor. This information line can also assist organizations in identifying local and national resources. So the call for health and many of our support services all relate to our Ag Worker Access campaign. And CFH has led this campaign since its initiative in 2015. And the main goal of this campaign is to reach 2 million agricultural workers and their families um, and help them access healthcare. So it's important that we all continue to um, support this effort so that this vulnerable population can receive quality health care, especially at this time when they're at incredible risk um, with the current pandemic. A few of our other resources that are available on our website um, are listed here. They include patient education materials, tools, templates, different digital stories, archived webinars, and also information related to our campaign. We encourage you as well to contact or follow up with our national training and technical assistance partners listed here, who also offer training as resources to health centers serving the ag worker population. So with that, we conclude our webinar and open it up. I know we only have a, a few more minutes left, um, so we can take any questions that might come up. And um, uh, Sylvia, I'll pass it back to you.